My guest today is Brent Steinman. Brent, how are you? I am doing fine, David. How are you? I'm doing great. How many times have you been on my show? Uh, which show? You've got several of them. <laughs> <laughs> this show, Technology and Friends. Um, I think this might be my third, maybe fourth? At least three. It's got to be at least maybe maybe five. I don't know. I'll go back and count. Uh, uh, and, and you know what's weird, what's weird about this show? This is the first time that I've recorded remotely. I've always had a rule that I always wanted to do this show in person. I never wanted to call somebody up or Skype with them or Teams or Zoom or FaceTime. I always wanted to be face-to-face -face with the person I'm talking to. And then suddenly the world changed Yep. a few weeks ago. Uh, we're all confined to our homes here because of the coronavirus. Mm-hmm. And so I made a decision, you know what, I, uh, I'm going to start doing remote interviews. And uh, you were the first guy I want to talk to because you've been doing remote interviews for a while with, with your show. Tell me about yep. your show. So I've got a, a podcast program I started back in October that is for the, the team we're both part of. That's a commercial software engineering group at Microsoft. And doing it virtual was kind of a, a requirement because... Our, our team is quite a few people, but they're spread all over the globe. And I wanted yeah. to highlight the fact that even though we're remote, we're part of a larger team and kind of bring people together. And the very nature of that kind of dictated that I would be talking to folks that are members of that team that are, that are literally all over the globe. And quite often doing that in person is just not possible. Um, it would actually significantly limit the number of people I could talk to. So Absolutely. from the very, very get-go, we started doing everything remotely. Yeah, so I took the opposite approach. I, rather than uh, bringing people to me virtually, I would go around the globe, and I would go to Sweden, <laughs> I would go to Romania, and I would record in uh, Seattle or wherever people happen to be. I did some in South America, and yep. uh, and that was fun, and it was really great to connect with people. But as I said, that's not really practical now. And um, uh and so we're doing it this way, but it's, there's some challenges, right? What uh, you've got more experience with this. What what are some of the challenges of remote recording? Well, I think one of the first big challenges is just getting them scheduled. Um, okay. w when you're doing things face to face with people, and you've got all the equipment right there, you can, you can almost kind of use a little bit of an ambush tactic. And it's harder <laughs> to say no to somebody when they're right there, and you're having a good conversation, and you're like, you know, why don't we just go ahead and do an episode of my show right here? It'll only take five, 10, 15 minutes, and we'll have a great conversation. Uh -huh. When you're, you're trying to schedule people virtually, it's one, a lot more difficult to get them pinned down and say, yeah, I'll do it. And even once you do, it's real easy for them to reprioritize and ask to reschedule and push things out. So I probably have to spend a little bit more time trying to make sure we've got a queue of guests lined up. Uh, I've got a task right now. I've got like 15 people that have said they'd be on the show that I need to be following wow. up with and make sure we get their, get them locked in before I run out of recorded interviews. Hmm. How many have you done so far? Um, I think we've recorded 24, 25 interviews so far. Since October, um, that's impressive. Yep. Yeah, we've been trying to stick pretty close to once a week. We've missed a few. Um, holidays, of course, were hard. Um, other things intrude. Uh, I've like your day job? <laughs> yeah, like my day job. Or, you know, things like the pandemic that's going on has a lot of people really busy. We had, I think, three lined up that were scheduled, and all of a sudden we had to put them off because those po people had been put on projects related to the COVID-19 responses that Microsoft's making. So oh. I, I'd much rather have them spending time on that than having to take time out to be on my little uh, podcast. So I'd say saving the world is a, probably a higher priority. Not that yes. your podcast isn't important. <laughs> It's it's impacts pale in comparison, so yeah. we're, we're more than happy to make that sacrifice. Yeah, although I will say that uh, things like this, getting information out to people, entertaining people, connecting with people, that's that's also important. Uh, yep. Sometimes, maybe in a time of crisis, to see it, it's important goes up a little bit. Yep, definitely. Yeah, but not the same as saving lives. That's a <laughs> that's a big deal. <laughs> yep, um, I'd say uh, some of the the other challenges are the ones you're encountering yourself. I mean, uh, I've seen the rig you use when you're doing your show out and about, you've got your camera, you've got your nice little, um, 
Zoom X6, if I'm remembering the the model number of the unit. It is a we zoom. both use. To, I've forgotten what model it is, but it's, uh, yep, it's um, a Zoom. Yep, but a couple it, of that's, shore mics. Yep, but you've got a couple of nice mics. You're right there. Zoom does a great job about making sure the tracks are synced up. When you're doing this stuff virtually, um, you could use you know the built-in capabilities of whatever video conferencing platform you're using, whether it's Teams, Zoom, um, Skype. You know, th there's a ton of other ones out there as well. The problem is, is then you're always dependent on their servers to do the recording, which means it's going over the wire, which means it's being yeah. compressed and you don't know the quality of their internet connection. Or so that introduces, even. yeah. So that creates a lot of challenges in itself. Um, you add to that, that now you're dependent on whomever you're interviewing with to have recording equipment. You and I are both into this a little bit. So we've got our equipment. I've got my nice little mic and stand here. Um, yeah. It's flowing through a really nice little focus, right? Uh, analog to digital converter that then flows into my computer into audacity. That was something that, you know, it's a non-trivial investment in just in the hardware. And then you have to learn the software. And when you're doing virtual recordings, now all of a sudden you're having to adjust to whatever that person happened to have handy you're sometimes having to educate them on how to properly use it and make sure the, you know, they're testing the microphone, that they're getting the right sound levels and they're not overdriving things. So that introduces a whole slew of challenges there. Once you get by that, then you're into, now how do I mix these? So um, you and I right now, you're recording, you're into the conversation, I'm recording mine, we're recording the meeting, so we've got a backup copy of the audio. But I when got it comes that idea time, from you. But now that we've got this, when it comes time to produce it, you've now got to synchronize the video with the audio. You've got to synchronize my audio with your audio. And even though we tried to hit the record button at the same time, there's still going to be a little bit of a shift there. Yeah. My sound levels may be completely different than your sound levels. So as you're doing that post-production, you've got to try and mix that in. So mm -hmm. it's just a whole lot of stuff. And we add into that that you're now sitting in people's homes everybody has a lot of other people home that's a big transition for me i've been working from home for seven years but i have everybody else working from home now too so part of me is going i really want to go somewhere else right. um just a little bit i love my family but it does create <laughs> new distractions that i'm having to learn to adjust to but with that comes in um, you know, my daughter coming into the house and talking to her mom in the next room. And is that getting picked up by the mic or my son was outside working on a project for me earlier. So he had his big air compressor and his cutting wheels going and was cutting metal. And, you know, it's just part of what you have to learn to try and deal with. Oh yeah. A lot of those issues you talked about actually are, they're the same issues when I'm recording remotely. Like there are, there is background distractions, mm -hmm. you know, if I'm in the middle of a conference center and uh, people are walking past and uh, there may be different sound levels, even if it's my equipment, uh, I may be talking to someone that's particularly loud or particularly soft spoken, or maybe they don't hold the microphone exactly as far away from their mouth as I do. So there, I still have to mix those together. I have to sync the different tracks together. Yeah. Yeah, fortunately, there's a, a lot of good tools. One, the the Zoom recorder we both use. You can you get a nice little readout on their on its screen, so you can tell if people right. are overdriving their mic, and you can kind of adjust on the fly. Audacity yeah. has tools to do the sound leveling as you're doing the the post production work, and then there's a really good website. Um, I forgot to bring it up, and I think it's Auphonic. Um, it's a free website that you can do to used to do things in the post-production realm like removing noise um, cleaning up hums and clicks and it also has a feature to do some load leveling um, the nice thing about that software is it's actually available for free for up to two hours of recordings per month oh nice i'm yep. looking and at it, it right now auphonic.com a-u-p-h-o-n-i-c.com yep Yep. So I use that. Um, I'm a little bit lucky in the fact that I, I just have to use it for the audio recording, um, mm -hmm. but I can run it through there. It gets all that load leveling down. Um, but even that comes with some trade-offs because while it'll do a really nice job about leveling the volume levels out so I don't have to mix the individual pieces, it does introduce just a tiny bit of echo in the background. So you're paying a little bit of a price for some of that convenience, but it's still a great tool to use. Tell me a little about, about your recording process. How do you go about it? Um, so when I sit down to record a show, the first thing I do is make sure the invite for the show lists off 
the general flow that we're going to try and do. So usually it's we're going to you know the we're going to kick it off with a little bit of a discussion around here's what we want to talk about on the show because um, I try to not make people have to do a bunch of thinking about it beforehand. But I like to make sure we list off here's the topics we want to hit in the interview, yeah. and I'll put those in a file that's shared during the call so we can both look at it to help us remind ourselves what are the key points we wanted to talk about. Um, that's helpful, especially if you've got somebody on the show that has a project they want to talk about or plug, or maybe it's just the, the larger topic. Like even when we were sitting down for this, I came up with eight or so bullet points that we could talk through as part of this interview um, about doing the recordings. So we'll, we'll create that list. Once that list is created, we sit down and walk through the recording software, how it works, make sure they're able to do a recording on their end. So like Audacity, the current version doesn't work on Macs, or at least the latest version of the Mac OS software. Oh, how do you handle that for Mac users? Um, fortunately, um, oh, I'm blanking on the Mac playback software. Um, yeah, I'm completely blanking on the name oh, of just, it. Oh, uh, just the one Quick that, ships, uh, Quick Time yep. that just ships with Mac. The yep. So QuickTime will actually do a really good audio recording, providing you've got a decent source on it. Um, so I just have them record it in QuickTime, and then they can export the file and share that with me. Um, but we'll get that sorted out. And then at that point, we'll, I usually count them in doing a three, two, one, hit record. We'll both hit record nearly simultaneously. A really quick, hi, thank you, welcome to the show, similar to what we did here. And we then let the interview start unfolding based on the bullet points we recorded. Uh, and then, um, then the interview starts. And do you just run, jump right into it, or are you um, or do you spend a little time prepping your guest? Um, so the prep occurs before we actually get to the recording. So we walk through what the you general just, flow. You just jump right into it. Yep, yep. And we do do a little bit on my show because part of the goal is to bring people together. So the first few minutes of the interview are always learning a little bit about the person. We try to focus on things people might not know. It was like a, I was actually mixing a production earlier today. What most people don't realize is the person I interviewed is actually very um, active in the piano community. So cool. he, he's an avid piano player. So we talk a little bit about that. And then eventually we transition into the topic. And we've had some interesting things come out about that. It's I'm amazed at how many people that are in the IT field come from non-traditional IT backgrounds. They didn't go to school for mathematics or science or computer science. I've interviewed several people that actually had music and theater backgrounds and just happened to find their way into IT. Um, so it's, it's really neat kind of hearing some of those stories and helps bring people together a bit. And then we just naturally, as part of the conversation, find a good spot where we start transitioning over to talk about whatever the, the key talking points for the show were for that week. Nice. Uh, and then there's afterwards. You're done. Oh. You say goodbye. Thank you for, and now you're third. The guest's work is done, but yours is just beginning, right? Yep. Yep. That my work is beginning. So when we're finished with the recording, we both hit the stop button. I help walk the guests through. How do they export the audio file? How do they share it with me? Um, I like doing the things via teams because teams is very forgiving about being able to share files. So they can export it and they can literally just either attach it or drag and drop it into the team's conversation. That then shares the file with me. I download it, play it, make sure it's the recording has come through okay, that I can hear their audio. And at that point I let them go and it's time for me to go to work. And then it's firing up Audacity, pulling all the tracks in, getting the, the time series data on the track synced. So I want to make sure if you say hi, I said hi back and that the spacing between those things is all pretty good. Once that's mm -hmm. done, it's listening through the tracks, cleaning up background noise. Somebody might accidentally bump their microphone or drop a pen on a table. And the nice thing about having separate tracks versus just doing the, the video recording where it's all one audio track is I can very easily mute my track or their track out when somebody's coughing or making a background noise. Right. I can eliminate that without interrupting the other person. If it's all one audio track, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. But I'll go through, do all that mixing, finally come up with what I call a rough cut. Um, with the rough cut done, I'll then export that, usually as either a WAV or an MP3 file, import that into a tool like Alphonic to do the final post-production on. And the result of that is a usable audio file that's in an MP3 that's all tagged and ready to go. And 
I can then upload that directly, or in my case, I also run it through another product called Wondershare. That was one I actually had to pay for. And that one, so Wondershare is a video editing software versus Audacity, which is audio only. And in my case, I wanted to make my podcast available for people to easily be able to subscribe and listen to on their mobile devices. Um, unfortunately, my show is not a public show. It is restricted to members of our organization and of Microsoft as a larger whole. So I can't just publish them out on Apple iTunes or something. So I had to have a way of restricting who can access the content. The most easy way to do that is to make sure they're in OneDrive for Business, which allows me to very easily click a box and say members of my organization can view this file and nobody else can. So that means I'm uploading MP3 files and subscribing to MP3 files sitting in a file share in OneDrive for Business isn't the easiest thing. So what I do is I use Wondershare to create a video file. And it's really nothing but the audio with a little slide background that just says, here's my CSE Shop Talk podcast. Here's the episode and who the name is, just as a title slide. Paste that in, record it, and export that as a video file that I can then put into Microsoft Stream, which allows me to create a channel and I, people that can then just subscribe to the channel. Then on a mobile device, it makes it very easy for them to go, here's the channel, here's the latest video, and I want to play it on my phone. Okay, so Wondershare really is just a repository for holding these uh, video files, or no, it's, it's just a stat, static image, but you've got some security around it, so you can link to it from OneDrive. Well, right? w Wondershare is the software I use to create the video file, oh, and then once it's okay. created, I then export it out of that tool and upload it into Microsoft Stream. Into Microsoft Stream, I see. Yep. Uh, and because they use that because Microsoft Stream only supports video and not just audio. Yep. Is that right? Okay. Yep, I, I've filed a feature request on that one, but I think it's pretty low on the totem pole right now. Well, you never know. <laughs> Maybe I'll file a feature request, and they'll have that'll double the number of votes, <laughs> or I'll update update your upvote yours. Yeah. Uh, so are you, uh, it's a twenty sub episodes now, right? Are you having mm -hmm. fun? Are you enjoying it? I I am right now. It's a little bit stressful because of all the things that are going on, both at home and in the world, and with mm -hmm. work, but. I still enjoy doing it. I still like talking to people and hearing their stories. And it's even fun to go back and mix the recordings and listen to it again. Because as, as you're well aware, when you're doing an interview and you're in the thick of a moment, you don't always get to sit back and kind of relax and enjoy the interview itself. You're too focused on the mechanics of what you're doing. So it's kind of nice in post-production just to sit back and listen to things. Um, it only gets stressful if you've got... an interviewee that you're talking with that um does a lot of uh, um um and and you know because that's a lot to clean up so yeah. those can get a little bit tedious but fortunately i really don't have that happen a lot i find it's also stressful as i'm listening to it and i think oh i should have asked this other question this would have been a perfect <laughs> follow-up question yep. and that's days later and i've uh, the moment has passed yeah, i'd say that uh, the biggest thing for anybody that's going to do this is the more prep you do up front the smoother the recording process goes and the smoother the recording process goes, the easier post-production ends up being. And you right. will learn as you go through. It's like one of the early lessons I learned was make sure the person has a set of headphones because if mm -hmm. they don't and they're just using the, the speaker and the microphone on their laptop, what you end up hearing is quite often you get a momentary echo coming back through on your recording. Right. Yeah. Uh, I think even though my show is video, I think audio is more important than video. I'd rather have bad... If it's, if these are my only cho two choices, I'd much rather have great audio and mediocre video than great video and mediocre audio. Yep. I agree with that one. Uh, have you thought about uh, doing something similar for the masses, making something public? Um, it, it's... I, I could definitely think I could do it. The problem is, is I want to stay focused on some other things. Mm, and I think adding, time. yeah, because it, it already takes, I, I'd say for each 30-minute podcast that I'm producing right now, I've got somewhere between two and three hours or two to four hours invested. And I'm including setting up the interview, getting the guests lined up, getting the recordings made, producing them, and then publishing them. Right. That That's quite a bit of a time sink, especially when I'm trying to do that every week. Mm -hmm. And I just don't want to overcommit with all the things that I like to do. So I think for the time being, if I did anything, it might be a one-off or on an, on occasion. I don't think I have an immediate plans to try and do something more broadly. Excellent. 
Well, it's been, let me see, about six months now. Any mm -hmm. other thoughts you want to share about this experience and how people could get started if they want to do something like that? Um, I'd say the, the only other thing I want to we probably should add is if you're doing something like this, you should probably do something you have a passion about because you are going to be investing some time. Do it because it's something you want to do, not because you've got ulterior motives. Cause some folks will start these things thinking I'm going to become rich. I'm going to become famous. Yeah. Um, that can Hasn't happen for me yet. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it's something that can be a side effect of it, right. but you should be doing something you love doing. Yeah. because you want to do it, not because you want some ulterior motive for it. Um, I think even if you look at a lot of the social media personalities that are out there, and that's kind of what expired, inspired me to start trying to do my show, um, looking at my kids and how they consume content and realizing that there was a lot to learn from that approach. But most of the, I think the best of those personalities just started out people doing something they enjoyed doing. And those are the shows that really ended up taking off because that passion came through in what they were doing. And that's what I think people really try and identify with. And it doesn't matter if your passion is just doing stupid things or doing makeup or cooking right. or whatever it may be. You have to have that passion and that's what people are really interested in. And that's what's going to make you continue to get up every day or every week and put that content out there. I totally agree. For me, it's um, the passion was getting to know smart people, uh, finding out, learning from them, and becoming friends with them. And this yeah. this show that I'm doing has been a great conduit for that. So that's uh, if you if you want a smart person for the show, I can go try and find one. I already got <laughs> I already got you, Mister. <laughs> like it or not, you're my smart person. <laughs> I'll, I'll do my best to fake it today. I appreciate your time, Brent, and you have a great day. Thanks for being All with right. us. Thank you, sir. We'll talk to you again soon. So I think the, the thing I like best about doing these kinds of podcasts and these types of virtual interviews is the fact that technology can help bring friends together.